my name is Emma West. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Birmingham. And I'm doing a research project at the moment which looks at how utopian ideas in the 1920s and 30s reached the British people. So as part of this project, one of my case studies was going to be the Temple of Peace. As you might know, the ideas behind it were very utopian in terms of bringing peace and justice and health to the people through a building. And so I was very interested in how the building did that and what was the relationship to Cardiff Council and to the state and to Lord Davis. So I wanted to kind of explore and tease out that relationship a little bit more. As part of that, I went to go and do research at the archives at the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth, and I was hoping to find certain documents. So I was hoping to find lots of minutes which were relating to the establishment of the temple. So I thought there'd be lots of kind of official documents from the council and the relationship between Lord Davis and the council. I couldn't find any of that. And what I could find was very boring. It was kind of legal deeds and things like that. But what I did find during that that visit was I found lots of material relating to the opening of the temple, which I didn't know that much about. I knew about Minnie James and opening the temple, but I didn't know about um, all of the kind of behind the scenes stuff which happened in order to, to get the temple open by Minnie James. I didn't know that there was a competition which took place. I didn't know about all of the kind of the different options they had for that opening. So my research went from being about one thing to ending up being about the opening and Minnie James and the mothers of the world and that process. And so in terms of the, the building, how, yes. how did you first hear about? That was in 2012 and it's a rather long-winded story in as much as I was in America at the time. Uh, I was doing a fellowship at the Library of Congress in Washington DC, but I'd recently got engaged. Um, and as part of that, I really wanted to get married in a building in Cardiff or in Wales, which was from the 1920s or 30s. So my research is always focused on that period and I just love it, I'm obsessed. I feel like I was born in the wrong decade. And so I wanted an art deco building, but they're very hard to come by. And doing research online from America, I found out about this building, Temple of Peace. And I'd been at a student at Cardiff about 10 minutes away, if that, in the Arts and Social Studies area in Cardiff, about five minutes away, and I'd never known about the Temple of Peace before. And I think that's a story which is quite common to a lot of people that you talk about, about the Temple of Peace, that they didn't actually know what it was. They walked past it many times and didn't know. And at that time, they had just a very small, brief website with the very tiny little photos. And so I couldn't wait to get back to the UK and to come back to Cardiff and to actually come and visit. And so I first heard about the temple when I was getting married here, essentially. When I, when I got married here, which is in 2013, I knew very little about the history. I just knew the kind of basic introduction that it was a gift to the Welsh people. I knew that it was a memorial to the First World War. At that time, I hadn't even seen the crypt or the Book of Remembrance. I hadn't been to this room, the council chamber. So I knew very little about it. All I knew was that it was a 1930s Art Deco building and I loved the look of it and I thought it was very romantic to get married here. It wasn't until a few years later that I started my current research project that I actually began to dig into the history a little bit more and that was when I went up to the National Library and began to find out and uncover quite a lot of the secrets of the building and it had a really profound effect on me. At first it made me wish I'd known it when I got married because I feel like I would have made more of it somehow but it also struck me that this is a completely unique building. This is one of a kind, this building. It's the only one in the world. And I found during my research that Lord Davis wanted this building to be the first of an international string of peace temples. And, and that hit me quite strongly because it's not just an experiment, this building, or it's not just a kind of, you could see it as in some ways as being quite self-indulgent. There's two organisations, the League of Nations Union, uh, the Welsh Council of League of Nations Union, and the Welsh National Memorial Association, which he was heavily involved in, and the building was built to house those. But I think it was a lot more than that. It wasn't just a place for these charities to be housed. It was actually something... The building was supposed to do something. It was supposed to be a building which was describes it as a beacon or as a shrine, a place to which people would march and dedicate themselves to the causes of peace, justice and health. So I love the ambition behind it. I love the kind of utopian idea that a building can represent that and it can make a difference in people's lives, not just as a memorial. I think we're quite familiar with buildings or structures being memorials, but this was a building which would inspire future generations. 
And so I think that's actually completely a one-of-a-kind concept. One thing I began to learn more about as I researched the building is how everything in the building has a symbolism to it. So I'm sure you have seen on the reliefs outside, um, the different reliefs representing peace, justice and health. And then as you come inside, all of the materials mean something. They're not just... They're not just grand materials there for the sake of it, although it is very grand, there's lots of marble, there's lots of wood, but it's, it's there with an idea and with a purpose. So in this building, um, in this room, you'll be able to see that there's a lot of walnut used, and in particular Australian walnut, and that was to represent the relationship between Australia and Wales, uh, ideas of international cooperation. In the Marble Hall, originally known as the Hall of Justice or the Hall of Nations, that was again created with marble from different countries, I think Portugal and Italy, in order to represent this international relationship and ideas of international cooperation. And again, I think we can't help but be struck by the parallels between the 1930s and today in terms of the political situation, in terms of international tensions and isolationism. So I think when we look at the temple and the ideas that it um, tries to espouse through these materials, I think it's really an inspiration. It is something which embodies its ideals. It doesn't just say that we should get on with each other internationally. It's kind of built that way from the ground up. And you were also fantastic. fantastic. <laughs> um, you were talking as well when I spoke to you on the phone about the um, umbrella stand. Oh, yes. So tell us a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's my favourite detail in the building, actually. Um, and hopefully you can get a close-up is of the umbrella stands and the building actually strikes me in many ways as a complete time warp you know you come in and as somebody obsessed with the 20s and 30s it's like a treasure trove because everywhere you look there's original details and the hat stands i love because they're a very unusual shape they're i think an octagon but they're very angular and it just is, is a kind of particular moment in time that people still needed hat stands, they needed umbrella stands, but even those were designed to be part of the building. So in, in German, there's this idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk, which means the total work of art. And I think that's what this building represents, the idea that every single part of it, no matter how tiny, in this room, you'll also be able to see there's light switches and they're made from brass. And so everything you see is kind of designed and conceived as part of a whole. And that's very important. That's a very modernist ideal from this 1920s, 30s period, that everything works together in order to create a unified message. Yeah. Well, I think the building has an amazing legacy in many ways. It's continued to be the centre of international peace campaigns throughout the decades. Um, and in this very room, again, behind me, you can see the Russian doll um, from the 1960s um, collaboration with Soviet Russia at that time and the youth delegations that came over. So there's lots of memorials and records in this building, lots of histories of that, those campaigns for peace in all the varieties and forms over the century. But in many ways I feel like the temple unfortunately never quite lived up to those huge expectations that were placed on it. And I think the reason for that is because it was completed in 1938, just a few months before the Second World War began, it, it never really fulfilled what Lord Davis hoped that it would. So I was mentioning the idea of an international string of peace temples. That never happened, I think, because the Second World War happened. And obviously the mood changed, but also finances changed. You know, countries weren't able to suddenly put up money to build peace temples when they were in the middle of fighting a war. So it's quite unfortunate, the timing of it. The building, after all, was conceived in the late 1920s. The plan submitted in 1930, but it wasn't built until 1938. So it was a very long process. So what I've really tried to do in my research and what I'm hoping to do with this event we're organising in November for the 80th anniversary is to try and get back to those original values and to try and get back to that idea that Lord Davis had of the building being a shrine. He described it as a new mecca, well, actually, it, the press described it as a new mecca. I don't know how Lord Davis felt about 
that phrase and that term. But I think it fits quite nicely with his vision for the temple, which was that people would come on these pilgrimages and they take part in a service of dedication. And through archival research and through the archives here at the temple, we've been able to find what that original order of service and service of dedication looks like. So we're using that as a structure for an event in the 23rd of November. And what we're doing is we're looking at each particular particular part of it, each constituent part, and saying, what would a dedication look like today? What might a reading be today? What might a hymn or equivalent of a hymn look like today? What would the prayers be for? Would those be from a single faith, would they be multi-faith? Would they be something that you don't need to have a religion to take part in? We're trying to make it something that's for the community and that the community can take part in as well. Um, we're hoping to, have, for instance, have choirs from the community, people singing and taking part in a new choral piece designed for the 80th anniversary. So it's quite an ambitious event, but I think it's helping to get us back to the sense of this building being a gift to the Welsh people and to the people of Cardiff in particular. So it's something that in, in many ways belongs to them and they can take an ownership of and feel like they can come here and be inspired to make change in the world and that it's not just a memorial to the past. As much as I love the 1930s-ness of this building, the whole idea is not that it is just a kind of piece of history, it's a piece of living history and it's something that hopefully can continue to make change in the world. I think there's a lot of questions as to, to what's going to happen to the building over the next 80 years. Um, it, the building's recently changed hands. Um, Cardiff University now own the building and so I think there's this is a really good moment actually coinciding with the 80th anniversary to really rethink what the building does and what it does in our community. Um, one suggestion and one thought that we've had is that afterwards the tours that we've been developing of the building would be available more regularly. Um, there might also be, for instance, interpretation materials. There's a few in the foyer downstairs, but there might be more interpretation materials around, um, say, in the council chamber, there might be a small exhibition about the history. Just so that if people do come to the temple, I mean, lots of people use the temple for all sorts of different things, but if they're in the temple, that they can at least get a sense of the history. I'd also personally like to see school children coming here um, from Cardiff, from Wales, and learning about the history, and maybe taking part in some sort of service of dedication, because I know that children did that during the Second World War. We've got the visitor books here which show that. And I think that must have been quite a profound experience to come and take part in that. And, you know, I think so much of this work relies on that next generation and making sure that they understand ideas around peace and justice and health and how we can achieve that in the community and internationally. They're very big ideas. So I think actually coming to a place which is dedicated to that is a really good opportunity. So, yeah, more partnerships with the university, more partnerships with schools, getting the word out there with events like at the 80th anniversary, hopefully getting some media attention and just making sure that it's a building that people know about and are proud of I think because it is the only one in the world and so we want to make sure that people know and use this building in the spirit for which it was intended. And do you have a favourite room or space? Oh in the goodness I well I, I very much love all the building but I obviously find the crypt very powerful and very moving and when we did a tour of the building in April we had a reading in there for, for a first person account written on the day that the temple opened and it's a man writing and he's by himself in the crypt with the book of remembrance and he's remembering the the sound of feet in the trenches as he's down there and he's talking about how it's the kind of one space where you can come where the everyday world recedes and you're just left with this quiet space of contemplation to think about the first world war for that generation it was only 20 years ago so he may himself have served in the trenches i think there was a suggestion that he did so it was a lot closer to home but i think hearing that reading in the crypt was a very powerful and quite moving moment and it was relatively long we were kind of worried that it was going to be overwhelming for people to just stop and listen but it was completely silent everybody was transfixed by that and that was a very powerful and moving moment for us to share and to it just brought it closer that sacrifice that people in the first world war made and i think that's the power of the building that it can get you to that particular moment and have a space for a reflection Jeez. 
Was there anything you would like to say to the Temple of Peace? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations to the Temple of Peace. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of your achievements that you've made and the fact that you are still standing and still in such great condition. And so I, I think so much in the spirit of what Lord Davis intended and Percy Thomas, the architect, I think it still embodies all of those ideals. And I think it's up to us now to ensure that the building continues to live up to those ideals. So thank you, Temple of Peace. Look forward to your next 80 years. And just going back to the new Mecca project, I yes. to ask, so the, the poster that you had, it says... Yes. Um, where are the peace builders? So where are the peace builders? Uh, good question. Um, so as part of the new Mecca project, we've been asking, where are the peace builders? And part of that question has really been to start people thinking about peace. I think when we, re when we started the project, we realised how big and how abstract some of these concepts are. And... The Temple of Peace, in many ways, its problem has been that the ideas are too big and too ambitious, that it's the Temple of Peace and almost the, the Temple arrives and it's supposed to just generate peace by dint of being here. But obviously that's not the case, it's people who create peace. And so in asking where are the peace builders, we're trying to start that discussion about who are they? Are they in the community? Are they people you know who you might think of as peace builders like politicians or activists or are they actually you and me are we all peace builders can we all play a role in building peace not only in our community but more broadly and i suppose the temple of peace becomes the kind of focus point for those discussions because it opens up a kind of a new way of thinking hopefully about peace not that it's something kind of external to you or something that we already have and we you know we almost take it for granted, but it's actually saying, well, the peace is something that we need to work at and we need to work at together. And, and so it's, yeah, starting those discussions and hopefully it's something that we can create ceremonies or create events which place peace at the centre. And does the importance of that, I mean, obviously it does, but does it resonate with you? Oh, yeah, completely. I mean, it's, it's something that I've been lucky enough to grow up having peace. But I've always been interested in and passionate about international development, um, the plight of other countries. And I think it's, it's a huge question that any of us have who have a kind of social conscience is what role can we play? And for me as an academic, it's very important that my work does something in the wider world. And sometimes that's difficult if you're kind of a historian because I specialise and love the 20s and 30s. But it's very easy just to kind of say, well, the, all of these interesting things happened 100 years ago. But that doesn't really create any change often in the world. And so a challenge for me personally has been, well, what things can I take from the research? What ideas can I take and then bring them to contemporary audiences or contemporary contexts? And peace is something which I think resonates, not just peace, but peace, justice and health, the ideas of the building, I think resonate just as much today as they did in the 1930s. And so what I want to do is try and use the research which I've been doing to try and bring it to a new audience and ask, enable them to ask questions and prompt them to think about what role that they can play. And so I think for me, being able to ask these questions about peace is a wonderful way for me personally, but also as an academic, to stimulate discussion. <laughs> uh, one more. A bit, bit uh, cheesy, but um, <laughs> if the Temple of Peace could talk, what do you think it would say? Oh, oh that's a tricky one. Um, I, think, I think the Temple of Peace would shout, actually. I don't think it would talk, I think it would shout, because I think there's such a difficult international situation at the moment. I think the Temple of Peace would be waving and shouting and saying, I'm here, I'm a place where you can come and think about these ideas. I'm a place where you can come for discussion. I'm a place where you can come to remember. And I think when we look forward and we think about what we want to do in the future in terms of peace and international development, I think we need to look back as well because these ideas are kind of universal. They were being had in the 1930s, they're being had today. And so I think if we look back at buildings like this, you know, we can listen to them actually and learn from the lessons and the ideas which are embedded in them from the very beginning. So I think the, the Temple of Peace would be asking to be heard more 
I think it would want to be a bigger part of discussions today. I think it would be, in a self-deprecating way, I think it would be saying, you know, I'm quite important. I'm not just a kind of local interest piece. I'm a one-of-a-kind building. I'm the only one in the world. And actually, I, I could be used more, I think. I, I have more potential. I've got more to give, I think is what the Templar piece would say, because I think it is something that everybody in the United Kingdom and beyond should know about and should be a place that people come to have these important discussions. That I think is often overwhelming when you consider how many problems there are in the world today. And I think people do want to help, but they don't know where to start. And if places like the Temple of Peace could be just a rallying point, actually, for people to start having those discussions, start thinking, well, what could I do? What could I contribute? Then I think in many ways that's, that's the role of buildings like this just to kind of have, make sure that it's in people's awareness and then to make people feel empowered and inspired to be able to make changes.